blessings, isn't it? I've already mentioned I hope you are a person of thankfulness year-round, but what an opportunity is this time of year to, to make sure we're offering thanks to the one uh, with whom there is no variableness or, or shadow of turning, the one who has given us all things. And I thank God for his abundant blessings he's showered upon my life. And one of those blessings is this congregation and the family of God here at Burlington. I'm grateful to worship the Lord together with you tonight. Let's bow our heads. Let's invite the presence of the Lord to be among us tonight. Father, what a joy it is to gather into your sanctuary another time on this Lord's Day. You are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. And so, Lord, we gather in again tonight to give you the glory and honor that is due to your name. Lord, I pray that you would accept our worship tonight. May it, may it be pleasing in your sight. May everything that we say and do tonight exalt you, for you alone are worthy. Bless your people as they worship you tonight. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I'm going to sing it as Brother Tim comes to you. Get your hymnal and turn to 384. 384. Aren't you glad he constantly invites? 384.
178. 178. Somebody's got to do it. 178. <laughs>
for you. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Whit, for that report. I'm confident the preaching was just as well as the singing, but uh, we are thankful for the Lord's help and uh, traveling mercies and uh, Lord helping in that in that local IHC. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I can understand that. Absolutely. That's that, absolutely. That's true. That's true. Well, thank the Lord for, for his help and protection of that and that conviction. Nathan, go right ahead. Amen, Nathan. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Yes, Brother Keith. Amen. Uh I just want to say that I had a conversation with Mr. Cooper out there just a moment ago, and I, I, I'm going through this thing right now in my life where I have to make this big transition that I'm dealing with the issue of forgiveness. I got this forgiveness issue that it's hard for me to get rid of, and uh, but I see God working at the same time. You know, He's He's He's, he's, he's always there. And, and he put me with a lovely family right now that I'm hoping I can I can I can learn a lot and I can get close. I'm trying to get closer to him through the people that I see. Because I see lovely people here. I haven't seen, you know, every everybody's the same. So, you know, it's like a it's like a it's like God put me here for a reason. I don't know what his reason is, but I'm 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 I'm, I'm listening to him. Whatever his plan may be, I'm for it. Because so many times we 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 Get off track. I, I, I heard many sermons. I just heard the sermon last week when we were driving and we're off track. So everything that I hear, I, I, I compute it and I, I put it into my life. Sure. Everything. Sure. And I just thank you all for accepting me and uh, I'm uh, just keep me in your prayers and part of this forgiveness issue so that I can get a little bit more <clears throat> peace of heart and I can get closer to him because I can't get closer to him if I bear this. Sure. As long as I have, sure. so I need to get that out of the way, so I can I can see that that, that light at the end of the tunnel. Because right now it's kind of blurry, man. but I know every day God's dealing with me, saying you got to do this, you got to do this, and I'm saying, well, I'll do later. Everything's always later. But God said you need to get that off me because I got something I want you to do for me, but I can't have you do it because you're not going to focus enough to do it. Amen. Sure. All right. Thank Amen. you, Keith. Thank you. Let's let's be praying. The Lord will continue to help Keith. The Lord knows how, the Lord knows where each of us are, and He knows what we're dealing with, and He knows how to help us. And what a privilege it is to uh, to be the family of God that can help Keith and pray for him. The Lord will help him in his journey, and uh, the Lord will continue to help him. So let's let's make that a matter of prayer tonight as we pray. Yes, Rita. I feel like I'm behind on my praise. Sure. Often, or maybe want to miss often, 
And I think about what does that do to their life? Because I know what it does to mine. And, and so I've been thinking about these things and I was thinking about uh, Carrie actually a couple Sundays ago. We were driving home on the Albertson house for lunch. And she said, so there's church tonight? And she's always picked up about what day of the week it is. You can't go over to your church day or the Wednesday night day where we ride bikes or is it? <laughs> so she's trying to get it all figured out. But she said, so today there's another one? I said, yeah. She said, well, Mom, why two services? And she just said, he stopped. She said, just tell me, what is the point? <laughs> and you never had a long conversation with her and it could really curl your hair. <laughs> It doesn't have to be a message like that, but you can give God praise. <laughs> All right, right over here. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, Sister Cooper. In, in conjunction <clears throat> with what Cheryl Rubio said, I'm thankful that when I was quite young, the Lord gave me some parameters of what was appropriate for his day. Sure. Schoolwork was not. Mm -hmm. Playing classical music unless it was like Handel's Messiah or something. Was not. I took piano lessons. I played classical music, but Sunday was different. Mm -hmm. The activities that he let me do on Sunday, mm -hmm. and I'm so thankful that he gave those parameters. That Absolutely. this is a special day yeah. set aside yeah. to serve him, and I appreciate that. Absolutely. And there are times yeah. I'm not able to be here on right. Sunday. Right. And it's hard. Oh, it's sure. hard. It is hard to fill those hours. Mm -hmm. You know, for the point of. 
evening. So there have been some Sundays, I've been to the church three different places before the morning was over to get enough church, you know, if you knew where Brother Stepper was preaching. But <laughs> but I'm thankful. Okay. <laughs> The truth of the matter is, God has, has an opinion from everything in our life. And if you invite Him and ask Him to give you direction about how you should spend your Sundays and how, how you ought to live your life on Monday through Saturday as well, God has an opinion for you. And it may not always be exactly the way that it was for Sister Cooper or, or my wife, although I, I think probably there's, there's some... There's some bedrock truth in those state, in those uh, testimonies, but it may not be to the T exactly like them. But if you ask God how you should live and how you should treat His day, He has an opinion on that, and He'll be faithful to help you work that out. And, you know, I think there's there's a, a verse in, in the Scripture that people kind of use to to get their own way and do their own thing about work out your own salvation. But the rest of that verse says, with fear and trembling. You do that with fear and trembling, asking the Lord how you should live and how you should interact and, and how your life should be pleasing to the Lord. And so I'm confident if you invite him into your world and ask him how you should operate and live, he'll, he'll be faithful to show you. And that's not restrictive. Really, that, that friend, that shouldn't feel like restrictions. That should be freedom when we say, Lord, once I know what you have for me, what a privilege it is to live that life. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, these are good testimonies. Anybody else want to give God praise? All right. Right back here. Our parish church has a long time. Amen. Just as long as for Calvary to stay. Amen. That's a, that's a good, good little chorus that we sing. All right, right over here. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Wonderful. Maybe there's somebody that hasn't testified in a while, and you know you ought to. Is there anybody like that that needs to testify? All right, Sister, <laughs> Sister Winkler, it may not be you, but you go right ahead. I went to the computer to do a little adjustment thing on a on a paper that needed to be done for Sister Stella. And it wouldn't come up and it wouldn't do anything. So I called Wesley because he's my fix it guy. And he said, put this and this and this. And he said, let me try one more thing. And somebody needed my two double A batteries out of my keyboard. I think it's wireless. And it uh, wouldn't work. So I didn't have power in that point that I needed, and I did not want my life to get to the point where there's one little thing that stopped me from serving. That's right. <coughs> Good man. Praise the Lord. Good analogy. Amen. Amen. All right. Anybody else? All right. Let's take the course books. Let's sing course number 18. The key of C, just a closer walk with me. I am weak, but thou art strong. <laughs>
us from sin, frees us from the carnal nature. Oh, I thank God it's so good to be free. Amen. Well, we're going to look to the Lord in prayer tonight. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Albertson if he will lead us in prayer in just a couple of moments. We mentioned several requests uh, this morning. And I may not mention all of them again this evening, but we do want to continue to remember a pastor with a stepmother still has a fever this evening. And uh, if it goes up anymore, he may have to call his cardiologist. At least that's what the paper has suggested. And so I want us to pray for Brother Stetler that the Lord uh, would help that to be resolved and the Lord may give him a special physical touch. We also want to continue to remember Sherry Martinoli in the hospital. Have you talked with her today? Is there any, any update? Okay. Text been some communication. My guess is things are about the same anyway, so let's continue to remember. Um, she thought she might be a little bit better. Maybe a little better. All right. Well, thank the Lord for that. Let's continue to pray. The Lord would give her a physical touch. And, and uh, as, we, as we mentioned this morning in the loss of her sister uh, yesterday, let's pray the Lord would uh, be with that family and encourage them and give them special help. Brother well, Sankey needs our continued prayers. We mentioned this morning, was hoping to get out of the hospital uh, this afternoon, but uh, they were still concerned with his cough as well as some low blood oxygen levels when he would stand up. And so they're keeping him a little longer. Let's continue to pray for Brother Brother Sankey, um, I failed to mention Sister Albertson this morning, but let's continue to remember her as we pray. And then others that have been sick, uh, that are sick, the Tallmans, Joe North, um, Joan Hodnett, still about the same tonight. So let's remember all of these that are, that are battling the illness. Um, also, let's remember the young boy uh, that is going uh, radiation, that is undergoing radiation treatments in Judah. Let's pray for him. And uh, Sister Cooper mentioned that if anybody would be interested in sending him a card, uh, to let him know that you're praying for him. You may not know him. Uh, we don't know him necessarily, but I know that uh, even receiving cards of encouragement and that you're praying for him, I know would, be, would uplift his spirits and the family spirits. So let's pray and continue to pray for Judah uh, tonight. <clears throat> the Foreman family, the Buckler family. Um, Sister Hill's family, all of these have lost loved ones recently. Let's pray the Lord would, would be near to them and comfort their hearts. Are there any other spoken requests that you would like to miss? Yes, this, uh, Linda Scott also mentioned her niece. Let's remember, um, all right, let's remember this request. All right, so let's remember his niece and his pregnancy. The Lord is able to give special help. And also, as mentioned uh, this, this morning, that uh, Esther's wedding is coming up this week. So a lot of preparation, a lot of things going on to this. And I think I said Jeremy Byer this morning. That, I think he's <laughs> the things you say in the platform uh, behind the pulpit. But let's pray for Jeremy and Esther and their preparation for for this. And, uh, Lord, we give them special strength for this week. Any other spoken requests that you'd like to mention this evening as we pray? Dana O'Donnell's mom, Mrs. Robbins, is very sick and we're trying to determine blood work for the hospital. So I don't know. All right. Let's remember Anna O'Donnell's mother, Sister Robbins, uh, very sick. Let's remember her tonight. Let's remember the spiritual needs connected to this church and in this congregation. The Lord is able uh, for every one of them. And uh, remember our nation. Let's pray for a revival in our country. Oh, how we desperately need a moving of God and in our land. And, uh, so let's pray. Let's pray the Lord would send a revival our way, and not just in the you know in the political world, and, um, maybe in a general sense, but that there would be a mighty moving of God in the church. That the church would would stand up and. and uh, Resist the culture of the drift that is going on. The Lord would help us to make a difference. And it would be. Uh, there's, there's a balance there. Of, of obviously, we want to be kind and gracious. And, and we do want that. But we also sometimes, um, sometimes standing for truth doesn't always appear kind and gracious from the other side. But may God give us the backbone to stand for truth, but do it in a way that is winsome way that's attractive and a 
way that would point others to Jesus. Let's pray to that end. Maybe you have an unspoken request. You'd like to mention by enough praise hand. Many needs represented by those uplifted hands tonight. Let's stand together with the Alps and will lead us in prayer. Let's join with him as he leads us tonight. Yes, Lord, we thank you. We give you praise to the Lord. We give you thanks and praise to the Lord. We're grateful for the songs that we've sung already that remind us of your presence in our lives. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we can, we can come into your presence knowing, Lord, tonight that your ear is open to our cries. We thank you, Lord, that you don't turn us away. You don't turn a deaf ear to our cry. But, Lord, you invite us to come and delight when we come into your presence. So, Lord, we come tonight as you told us to come in boldness. Come boldly to your throne of grace. So, Lord, we ask you we want to send up our receipt of thanks for all that you've done for us. And how you've been trusting you, Lord, to continue to do your work. We pray for spiritual needs, Lord, that are among us. Spiritual needs that are connected with our community. We pray, oh, Lord, that you may have a Oh, Lord, we desperately need your assistance. We need your help. We pray for physical needs, financial needs, Lord, emotional needs, relational needs, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you're able for every one of them. There's none of them that escapes your attention. There are none of them that are out of the scope of your ability to work and your ability to help and your ability to intervene and change courses. And Lord, we thank you that you're able for every Lord, we trust you. Help every day. We pray for our nation, Lord. All of these, Lord, that are, in, that are in authority, we pray, oh God, that you would send the mighty moving of your spirit to the Lord, and you can help us to do that. In the church of Christ, we pray for us. For the revival in our hearts, for the revival in our hearts. Lord, would you please help us continue to motivate work in our hearts, Lord, to help us just satisfy with this tension. Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Albertson, for leading us in prayer tonight. Let me mention just something about the offering. Uh, offerings, thank you for your continued giving. And to the ministry here at the church and uh, for your tithes and your offerings. Thank you for your dedication in that. And uh, just wanted to mention that uh, the offering this morning for the Gideons was a little over a thousand dollars. So thank you so much for your giving. I know that's a great blessing to, to the ministry. And depending on how you figure up, it's a lot of Bibles uh, that they can provide. And so we thank you. Uh, for your sacrificial giving in that offering. Let me mention just a couple of announcements, maybe do a little bit more than I did this morning, take a little bit more time, but uh, obviously Wednesday night prayer and praise service here on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. I encourage you to be here for that. And then uh, Esther and Jeremy's wedding this Friday night. If you need uh, times or directions, all of that's on the bulletin board out there. And so we encourage you to stop by there if you need those. Maybe take a picture on your phone. That way, when Friday comes along, you'll have it. And uh, you'll know exactly where to go and the time and so forth. The very next week is Thanksgiving week. It's hard to believe that that's, that's so close already on the calendar. But that will be a uh, Tuesday night service that week um, to give you a lot, allow you a little bit more time for family travel, people coming in, or maybe you're leaving town for the holidays so that will be on Tuesday evening, the 23rd, so keep that in mind. A couple of things that I've not mentioned, uh, that I did not mention this morning, that I'll just point out, that are in the bulletin, November the 30th, that's a Tuesday, and December the 4th is a Saturday, are going to be set up, designated set-up days for the drive-through Christmas program. 
So <clears throat> I know that uh, some people may not be able to, uh, to come both days, or maybe you can't come for the, the whole time allotment, <clears throat> one to five on those days, but maybe you can come and give a couple of hours here and there, and we encourage you to do that. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's quite a bit of work to do what we do, and yet it's a blessing to our community, and, and it's, it gets the message, message out. You think about 900 or so that came through last year. How many would never have come through the doors of our church? But yet we have the opportunity to impact their lives. And so it is well worth it. And so we want to thank you for, for you working with us and investing with us in this event. And so if you can help us out for those setup times, uh, we'd certainly appreciate it. In the past, we have asked you to, uh, to bake cookies. Uh, but again, with, uh, with the COVID, we're going to at least give it another year and uh, just provide uh, prepackaged cookies out this year and instead of uh, a lot of homes making these the cookies. Maybe we'll be able to do that next year and we'll pray, pray to that end. But, uh, but for this year, we'll be doing the prepackaged cookies. So just want to make you aware of that in case you're wondering about that. Um, let's see here. Also, the church Christmas supper is going to be on Wednesday evening, um, December the 15th. So I want to make sure you put that in your bulletin. The 19th a.m. is the children's Christmas program. And then the 19th p.m. will be your candlelight service and community caroling. So those are several things that we wanted to mention. Again, you can read the announcement in the bulletin about the, the crafts, uh, the items that you will want for crafts for the children uh, for the weekly email. That will be included in the weekly email. And you can read that. And uh, I think that basically takes care of all of the announcements. Tonight, following the service, uh, will be our Laban Appreciation uh, gift for, for you, and maybe you saw it on the way in, but we have uh, worked to provide something for you, and so when you leave the service, I know Regina and Sharon will be out there and try to uh, help you receive those, those gifts from our heart to let you know that we certainly appreciate you, and it's, it's a joy, and I don't know if I conveyed it adequately. Uh, but thank you for the pastor appreciation gift uh, from the church as well as from you individually. We certainly appreciate everything, every gesture of kindness that you have you have provided and done for us. We we sincerely appreciate it. And this is just some tangible way to to give back to you and let you know that we appreciate you. And we'll be saying more in another service. But but tonight will just be the gift that we provide for you. All right, I think that's all the announcements. It's a joy to uh, have Esther Beyer come and sing for us at this time, and at least the last time to sing at this church with the last name Beyer, um, at least as the very last name. Uh, but I uh, so appreciate Esther and her life and her testimony and her sacrifice, giving to the kingdom of God here at Burlington. And we know the Lord is going to continue to use her in the next phase, this next phase of her life. But Lord bless her as she sings at this time. Well, I am so glad that I get a chance on um, my last Sunday here just to say thank you for being the best church family that you could have ever been for the past 17 years. And I've loved just being a part and working with your kiddos, and it's been just the absolute joy. And I think of so many times uh, people have talked about church being a hard place, and I, and I understand what they mean by that. But I look back over the past years and think about what a fulfilling place that this church has been because um, your kids have just made every single Sunday so rewarding and so exciting. And um, you really just have the best kids out there. And I love all of the adults, too, but the kids especially. Um, but this song that I'm going to sing is one of my favorites. I probably play it or sing it in my mind every single day. But it's based on Limitations 3 that says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord.
Returning once again in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. While you're turning there, I would uh, remind you that we began a few weeks ago in Leviticus chapter 19, the starting point of this series. <clears throat> and in this book, God gives to us four revelations of himself. He says, I am the Lord. We've called this the revelation of identity that we've been discovering and considering the last couple of times. He also says in that chapter, I am the Lord your God. This is what we're calling the revelation of connectivity. God connects himself with man. And he says, I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is the revelation of purity, the revelation of his character. And he says, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is what we're calling the revelation of activity or his ability. These revelations that, that God gives to the people of Israel are, are the byproduct of God's desire, God's longing to reveal himself to his people. To his creation. You see, this is, this is not something that God had to do. You recognize that he is God. He can do whatever he wishes. If he had wanted to, he could have concealed his identity to his people. But it is by his grace, by his love, desire within him, he is desired to reveal himself to us. Last week... As we looked at Exodus 34, we noticed six things from the passage. Again, we are now looking at the revelation of identity. So we're still on the first revelation that God gives to us. And we've looked at it a couple different times. We we've kind of started it off and, and then we went to a, a kind of a semantic journey that brought us to Exodus 34. And last week as we looked at this passage, we noticed six things from this passage. It began in Exodus 34 with God communicating to Moses 
And it ended with God declaring who he is to Moses. We noted, first of all, the communication. God spoke with Moses. We noted the expectation. God required Moses to do something. We noted the preparation. Moses followed the instructions that God had given to him. Then we noted the invitation. God invited Moses to a certain place at a certain time. There was the presentation. Moses accepted the invitation. And then following that presentation, we have the revelation. God came down to meet with Moses. And the proclamation, God reveals who he is to Moses. It's important to note that the final result of revelation and proclamation in this chapter I would suggest to you could not have happened, or maybe I should say would not have happened if Moses had not followed through on his part of the deal. If Moses had not followed through on the expectation God had given to him, if he had not followed through on the preparation and followed through in doing what God asked him to do, if he had not followed through on the invitation or the presentation, I don't believe the end of chapter 34 would have turned out as it has. Listen, God's revelation often hinges on human cooperation. God's revelation often hinges on human cooperation. We even think about the story of we, we are getting ready to celebrate Advent and Jesus coming to earth. That was the greatest revelation of God, sending his very own son in flesh and blood. Jesus was the revelation. But did you know it hinged on human cooperation? It hinged on a maiden girl saying, Lord, be it so to me as you have said. God's revelation often hinges on human cooperation. If you want God to continue to reveal himself to you, then it would behoove all of us to follow through on the part that God is asking of us. Now, with that overview of the passage, let's, let's dive a little deeper into the text tonight. <clears throat> have, you ever, have you ever heard a, a piece of information, maybe, maybe something foreign to you, or uh, maybe something shocking to you that... that the only response that you could give was maybe dropping your jaw. Anybody ever done that? It's about the only, only response you could give. And just when you thought you had heard it all, there was more, and your jaw drops a little more. And as the information kept coming, your jaw got lower and lower, and it was scraping the floor. Maybe you've had some of those moments. I, I can kind of imagine Moses on this occasion as he hears God's proclamation of who he is. I can almost envision Moses' jaw dropping. And then as God continue, continues to reveal who he is to Moses on this occasion, then his jaw continues to drop. I certainly can't prove Moses' jaw was dropping, but I am convinced that as a result of this encounter, as a result of this revelation on Mount Sinai, Moses has a deeper understanding of who God is. As a result of this, there is a, a, a greater appreciation for who God is. And I hope that we too tonight will have the same experience as we read again and study this revelation. Maybe our jaws won't drop, but maybe we'll have a deeper understanding and a greater appreciation. This picture that God gives of himself to Moses here in these verses is actually basic to both Jewish and Christian theology. And as we will see later on, as we work our way through this passage, it shows up in several other places in the Old Testament. In fact... An individual by the name of Dr. Brashears, who is a, a professor at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon, suggests that Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, are the most quoted passage in the Bible by the Bible. It's interesting. Let's read verses 6 and 7 again of Exodus 34. 
And the Lord passed by before him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. I want to divide this revelation of identity into four sections. Now, I think you understand that we cannot adequately unpack the attributes that are on display in this passage, we could not adequately unpack it at all if we tried. We couldn't do it in a series. But with our limited time to explore them, let me, let me suggest a, a simple format to help us work through these four sections in a quick and efficient manner. And by the way, we're only going to get to the first two tonight, so I won't keep you real long. I'm going to suggest that with each attribute section, we'll cover interpretation exploration and application. In other words, I'll attempt to define it. Secondly, we'll observe a passage of scripture for you to see the attribute on display. And then finally, how should it affect our daily living? Before we get right into the first one, let me mention a couple of observations that I think are worthy of mentioning. The first observation has to do with repetition. Repetition is a, a key ingredient in ancient writing, and we see it being used in the verses that we're considering. You'll notice, if you have your Bibles open to verse number 6, the Lord proclaims, the Lord, and then it says, the Lord God. Yahweh here is speaking to Moses, and he declares to him his name twice. As a writer, some of you are writers here this evening, and some of you write for opening the word, and uh, so maybe you're published in other places as well. But, but as a writer or an author in today's modern world, there there are many things that can be that can be used to to create emphasis. Uh, you'll find bold words. You'll find italicized words. Um, you'll find underlined words, maybe, maybe in color editions. You can also find highlighted words. And, and all of these are, are used, they're employed to, to draw attention to or to emphasize a certain word or a phrase. But in the ancient world, if someone wanted to emphasize something, they would repeat it. And so, so when Yahweh here mentions his name twice to Moses... He is essentially saying to Moses, take notice of my name. Moses, I want, you to, I want you to stop and I want you to consider my name. As a result of this repetition, we should also take notice of it. We ought to slow down for a moment and focus on who God is declaring himself to be. Repetition matters. The second observation is about order. Also, in the ancient language of Hebrew, the order or, or the structure of the sentence is also of importance to the reader. You know, if we, were to, if we were to witness an event that we were to then recount to someone else, we, we would declare the important details first, wouldn't we? I mean, if we were to witness a robbery... And then we had to tell the investigators what we, would, what we saw. We would, we would probably talk about ethnicity. We would talk about gender. We would talk about height. <clears throat> we would talk about the color of clothes they were wearing. Those things would be of importance. Not necessarily the, the style of socks they were wearing. Or which side of the head the hair was parted on. Those things... Those things you mentioned may have value in identifying the individual. The other things would help the identification process more rapidly. And in Scripture, the order represents importance. And the order in which Yahweh reveals himself is important for us as we discover who he is. So let's begin with the first section, the first attribute section. 
the Lord tells Moses, <clears throat> tells us the Lord is compassionate and gracious. Can you imagine this first jaw-dropping moment for Moses? We know that, that Moses knew that Yahweh was powerful. He knew that God was immutable. He knew that, that God was everlasting. But Yahweh is describing himself in a new revelation to Moses. The revelation of powerful and immutable and everlasting are, are not inaccurate. As we've said before, they, they help us in our understanding of who God is. But but Moses here is getting another glimpse of God. God is, on this occasion, on Mount Sinai to Moses, he is broadening Moses' understanding of who he is. The words here in the original language, as I understand it, is a, is a word pairing. In other words, they, they sound alike, but, but they also explain each other. So let's quickly, in interpretation, consider both words. The first word, compassionate, is often translated, as it is in the King James here, it's translated merciful. This word is from a, a, a root word meaning female womb, and it gives the thought of the feeling of a mother, the feeling a mother has toward her infant child. And Yahweh is revealing to Moses that, that he has feelings. This word, it's interesting that this word is, is used in the account uh, where the two ladies, you remember the two ladies that appear before Solomon fighting over the child? You remember that story? And Solomon in his great wisdom comes up with this ingenious plan to, to really find out who the real mother is. And he suggests that the baby be cut in two and that each woman be given a half. His plan worked because immediately the true mother was moved deeply out of love for her child. And she said, give the other lady the baby. It was, it was not the other lady's baby. It was her own. But she said, give the other lady the baby. She was moved by compassion for her own child. She was willing to let the other lady have the baby because she did not want the baby to lose its life. The word that God uses to describe himself is also used in that very account. Yahweh is telling Moses that just as a mother has compassion for her child, God also has a, a deep, moving compassion for us. That's the first word of the section. The, section, the second word is gracious. This word is, is not a feeling word as compassionate is, but it's rather an acting word. It means to, to show grace or show favor. It carries the idea of helping in time of need. So God not only reveals to Moses his compassion for his children, but that he also works on behalf of his children. It's not this, just that he's moved with compassion and then does nothing about it, but he is moved with compassion and then that compassion moves him. It propels him to act on their behalf. His feeling produces an action. Let's look at a passage of scripture where we see this attribute playing out in vivid color. Open your Bibles to Jonah, <clears throat> if you would. Assyria at this particular time is the dominant empire of its day. The capital city of Nineveh was the enemy of Israel. It's a wicked city, but God calls a prophet to go and preach to it. Essentially, Jonah is starting a home mission church in enemy territory. Anybody going to sign up for that? God has placed a call on Jonah's life to go to the wicked city of Nineveh. And I won't recount in great depth the whole story, but, but you know, at least most of you know the story. Jonah ran from the call. Jonah faced the consequences of that. He repented of his own sin. He finally went and preached that judgment was coming to the city. And believe it or not, the city repented and God responded. It was a very wicked city. But they repented, and God responds. 
And after all of that takes place, Jonah is frustrated. And here is where we read God's personal bio that was given to Moses in Exodus 34. Jonah says, I knew, this is in, this is in Jonah chapter 4. <clears throat> Jonah says, I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. So Jonah goes, and Jonah delivers the message and then he gets frustrated that God is who he is. Why is Jonah mad on this occasion? Why is he frustrated? Because God was compassionate. That God was being gracious to Israel's enemies. These Ninevites were wicked people who did horrible things, but... But did you know that God is, is not only compassionate and gracious to us, but he extends it to all people? Yes. Sure, we'll get to his justice in this study later on, but we have to recognize that just as God was compassionate and gracious to us in our sins, in your sins, and your sins may have looked differently than my sins, but he was compassionate and gracious to us in our sins. And just as he was to us, he longs to extend that to every person. That includes the rapist. That includes the, the molester. It includes the kidnapper and the adulterer and the liar. Listen, friends, God is no respecter of persons. Jonah was frustrated. Jonah was frustrated that God was compassionate and gracious to a country that was enemies to Israel. A country, a city that was doing revolting things, wicked things. And yet God showed compassion and mercy. You say, all right, what do I do with this? What's the application? Well, first of all, I would suggest that, that the initial response would be that our hearts should swell up in praise to a God who saw us in our sin. And he was moved to compassion for us. And then that compassion translated into an action that in that while we were yet sinners. You can help me finish it. Christ died. You know, tonight, I know we know this, and I believe we're grateful for it, but may we never treat that as old hat or home drum. God's compassion and graciousness made it possible for us to be who we are today. So let's apply it. In the oldest rabbinic writings of this revelation in Exodus 34, the rabbis speak of the action of imitating God. God often chooses to reveal what he's like to others by using our lives. And as God is compassionate and as God is gracious, so we are to place that on display in our life. You know, I guess that's, that's somewhat simple to do with our friends, isn't it? It's often easy, maybe not always, but often it's easy to, to display God's compassion and graciousness to our families. But what about our enemies? What about those who have it in for you? What about those people who slander you? What about those who, who put the knife in your back when you walk away? Do you have any, I guess we could call them friends, but do you have any people like that in your life? God longs to reveal himself to others through your compassionate and gracious heart. So this week, allow God to use you as a, as a conduit through which his compassion and graciousness can flow. 
And look out. It may be, it may be towards someone who is unworthy. It may be to someone who has hurt you. It may be someone who has slandered you or told a lie on you at the office. Or it may be that God wants you to put his compassion and graciousness on display in their lives. Just as God was compassionate and gracious toward us. Let's allow him to put that on display in our life. How will that play out in your week? I don't know. But I know that God wants to use you to put that on display. Let's quickly move to the second section. <clears throat> We're back up on the mountain now listening into the revelation that God proclaims to Moses. Yahweh declares to Moses that he is long-suffering or slow to anger. Upon hearing this, Moses, maybe Moses' jaw drops a little lower. You see, you, you have to understand that, that Moses was, he was living in a day when the inhabitants of his world were constantly trying to appease the false gods around him. Constantly worried that the false gods had it in for them and, and if, they didn't, if they didn't act right, they were going to destroy their crops or, or whatever it may be. Moses lived in that world. And Yahweh here is telling Moses, and this has got to be, this has got to be eye-opening to him. He tells Moses that he is not angered easily. Let's define it. The word in the Hebrew literally means long of nostrils. You know, when, when someone is angry, instead of spouting off, they close their mouth and Breathe through their nose. They are long of nostrils. <laughs> they are slow to anger. The writings in Proverbs enlighten us a little bit on this attribute. Proverbs 14 says, Whoever is long of nostrils has great understanding. Proverbs 16 says, Whoever is long of nostrils is better than the mighty. Now, I would, I would be quick to point out, slow to anger doesn't mean you don't have frustrations. It means that you have control of them. It's helpful to understand that, that as the verse translates it, slow to anger, there are, there are two things to consider. One is the idea that Yahweh is an emphasis on the first word, slow. It's, it's possible that, that the language Jesus grew up speaking was Aramaic. And there's a translation or a paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible in Aramaic. And it translates Exodus 34 as God is patient. The one who makes anger distant and brings compassion near. So God is slow to anger. But on a second thought. God is also slow to emphasis on anger. You see, God is patient. God is long-suffering. But the truth is, He does eventually become angry. His anger is a righteous anger towards sin. His anger, maybe if we could put it in, in, a, in, a, in a way that we could understand it. His anger is like a parent who is angry at the one who is enticing their children to evil. As a parent, you would be frustrated. You would be annoyed and even angered at someone who offered your child a cigarette or, or offered them some sort of drug or offered them a drink of alcohol. There would be something inside of you that would be angry about that. And God, in a similar way, is, 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 is like a parent who is angry at the one who's enticing the children. In fact, the psalmist speaks about God hating those who do, who do wrong. Sure, he's a God of love, but there's also an element of anger there when someone commits to doing sin. God gets angry with those who commit sin. Now, let's look at our example in Scripture. Believe it or not, in this 
exploration, we're considering again the city of Nineveh, but only from another book. If you were to leave the book of Jonah and you were to go to two books uh, further on in the, in the Old Testament, we'll find the small book of Nahum. And we have another prophet who speaks concerning Nineveh. This is 150 years after Jonah has come and gone. Unfortunately, the city of Nineveh had returned to its evil ways. They, they have taken 10 of Israel's 12 tribes into captivity. And God's slow anger has reached its limit. Listen to Nahum in chapter 1. He says, beginning in verse 2, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. <clears throat> the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Yahweh has been compassionate. He's been gracious to Nineveh. Yahweh has been slow to anger, but eventually God has enough about Nineveh's wickedness. And eventually they're destroyed. Have you heard of anybody that's a Ninevite these days? <laughs> the city of Nineveh was destroyed. But here's the thought. They're destroyed, but only after 150 years of wickedness. Think about that. Jonah preached repentance, and they repented, and I don't know when they turned, returned back to their evil ways. I don't know when that transpired. But as soon as they returned back from their evil ways, God didn't cut them down. God didn't send judgment immediately, but 150 years later. The nostrils of God are long and he's slow to anger. So what's the application for us today? How does, how does this affect us? <clears throat> you say, Andrew, that's a long time ago. What's, what's the importance for us? Well, we're back to the rabbinic teaching where we imitate God. The God who is slow to anger is our example for our interaction with others. Unfortunately, we are a culture, people too quick to anger. <clears throat> it's, it's amazing that your morning is going fine until somebody cuts you off in the lane on the way to work and it immediately can change your whole morning. Are we angry with the one who got the promotion instead of us? Angry with the one who took our boyfriend or girlfriend? We're angry with the one who pointed out our weakness. Angry with the one who laughed at our best efforts. If we're not careful, we can just quickly turn on anger. But our example is the Lord. Our command comes from James in chapter 1 and verse 19. He says, Be slow to anger. Are you slow to anger? When there's cause for anger or frustration in your life, I want to challenge you to, to have long nostrils. <laughs> Imitate the God on Mount Sinai and show the world around you that God is a God who is slow to anger. You'll have the opportunity this week, I promise you, you'll have the opportunity sure. to exhibit the slowness do it. You know, you'd be surprised if if uh, someone cuts you off in tra traffic and then you pull in behind them at McDonald's and you pay forward their meal. You know, you pay their coffee bill. You'll have opportunity. It won't be that necessarily. But you'll have opportunity this week to imitate our God 
and who he is and put who he is on display for a world that is watching who he is. Do it and allow Yahweh to be seen through your actions. Well, I tell you what, I want us to close by singing a couple verses of hymn number 68. If you have your hymnals there in front of you, <clears throat> I'll sing verses 2 and 3. Hymn number 68, Oh, to be like thee. <clears throat> Notice verse number 2, Oh, to be like thee, full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender, and kind. And then verse 3, Oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit, holy, harmless, patient, and brave. Let's put the attributes of Yahweh on display in our life this week. Number 68, singing verses 2 and 3. Oh, to be like full of compassion, loving,